حبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد والصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين نور مجالسكم بذكر محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد حبائي before we begin tonight's discussion becomes almost an obligation for us to take into consideration that today and yesterday has been an event or there have been events which are absolutely difficult on the Shia world. And one of these includes the bomb blast that took place in the city of Baghdad where it is reported preliminary figures that 150 people were shaheed and over another 200 of them injured. Attacks like these on predominantly Shia areas by the Khawarij of this time the Bani Umayyah and the children of Shimr and Umar ibn Sa'ad. And you find that the lovers of Ahlul Bayt till this day and age are paying the price for their love and their affiliation with Ahlul Bayt. You see, there is a, when preliminary figures like these are released within the news, 150 people they tell you are Shaheed. This 150 people is an average estimate from the rescue workers. And experience has always told us that when the figures actually come in, you find that the numbers were no 200, 250, if not more. This is one. Number two, when they tell you 150 people martyred, and another 200 injured. Ya akhi. When they tell you 200 people injured, number one, how many of these people actually survive these injuries? Again, experience tells you, maybe if you are lucky, 50% of the survivors survive. Yani from those who are initially categorized as injured, 50% of them will go on to die. And then from this remaining 50% who are injured, these are not light injuries. These are long-term injuries that a person needs to live with. Somebody has lost his leg, somebody has lost his hand, somebody has lost his eye. Breadwinners are no more breadwinners in the house. He's lost his hand, he's lost his leg. He has six children to feed. وَلِذَلِكَ حِبَائِي Being active in humanitarian work, خَاسَةً humanitarian work in Iraq, Aytam of Iraq. Today, one of the interviews that was being given, one of the survivors, she says, we woke up this morning and we went into the market. We thought that we will buy for our children Eid gifts. How did we know that the money we have saved instead of buying them toys is now going to be used to buy their kafan? This is a reality that we are living. This reality affects us or we are living in our own bubble where we don't really care of what happens in the environment around us. We said one of the philosophies of Shahr Ramadan is that you feel the hunger of the poor people. I believe we mentioned this on the Interfaith Day. 
This is one of the hadith of our eighth imam. Islam teaches us to be a religion of humanity, to feel and to empathize. And our participation in humanitarian work and medical aid and sponsorships and whatnot, persons should try as much as possible to not be a mokassir, to not feel short in his help and his aid towards the Aitam of Iraq. Today, if I've put together a gift pack for my child for Eid, I make a pledge that the amount of money that I spent on my child, an equal amount I will spend on somebody else's child, one of the Aitam inside of Iraq. And history has shown that if the she as we ourselves do not stand for each other, no one in the world will stand for you. Abadan. They take advantage because they know that this is a community that is weak and disintegrated and selfish and involved in their own. Nobody cares for the other. Before we begin the discussion, let us remember the shuhada, the families of the shuhada, what when Surah Al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina surat al-Mustaqeem. سرات الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد Over the last couple of days our discussion where we used سورة الأنكبوت as a starting point our discussion has been revolving around understanding the usage of the word fitna within the Quran where over the last three lectures or so we identified about seven different places within the Quran in which the word fitna is used and in seven different contexts or meanings that the word fitna is used and you will find that this sort of tafsir is crucial when it comes to a person who wants to improve his knowledge and his relationship with the Quran whereby Arabic language and one of the beauties of Arabic language and you find that this is a mushtarak property, a common property within multiple languages. That within any given certain language, you may have a single word that has multiple meanings. And you find that the meanings intended from this single word vary based on the context in which it is used. And therefore, from this avenue, in order to appreciate these words within the Qur'an and to appreciate the wealth and the treasures of knowledge which are there in the, within the Qur'an, you find that, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, wa shukar, seven meanings of the word fitna we are able to derive over the last few days. And today we continue with our discussion in that we will identify two other contexts or meanings through which the word fitna is used within the Quran, making them a total of nine. And subhanAllah, there are over 20 meanings of this word fitna within the Quran, in any case. Continuing with the first meaning for today and the eighth one in our series. Surah al dhariyat from verse number 11 to verse number 14. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yes, Aluna Ayana Yomuddin. Yoma hum ala nari yuftanun. Zuku fitnatakum. Hada ladi kuntum bihi testajilun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the day of judgment where there is a group of people who are subjected to eternal chastisement because of the wretched life that they lived on earth. And one of the characters of these wretched people is that they used to mock the advent of the day of judgment. See, verse number 12. They say one of their characters was 
yas'aluna ayyana yawmuddin whenever the anbiya would come to them they would mock them and they would say when is this day of judgment that you are promising us where is this day of accountability and this day of judgment and they would mock the prophets and belie their message based on this so one of the characteristics of the people who are punished by nar jahannam is that they used to belie the yawmul qiyamah so Allah will say them, ah, yes, aluna ayana yawmiddin yawma hum ala nari yuftanun. This day of judgment is where the people of hellfire are tested with a fitna. What is this fitna? Dhuku fitnatakum hadha alladhi kuntum bihi tasta'jilun In this verse the word fitna is used to describe the punishment in the akhirah Punishment on the day of judgment yani nar jahannam One of the meanings of the word fitna is nar jahannam Yawmahum ala nari yuftanun The fact that they are being punished in the hellfire This in itself is known as a fitna And one of the understandings of fitna You find that A person should always be mindful of some of the actions that he does Which can unnecessarily lead him towards eternal chastisement one of that is zulm in terms of hukukun nas to have taken an amana and then do khayana on this person to have taken a kardul hasana and to purposely default on this kardul hasana taking away from the right of somebody or refusing to return the right of somebody is a form of zulm that even on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive until the person who you sinned or wronged forgives you walidhalika as a community of entrepreneurs or as businessmen you find that it is absolutely important for us to always have our wills prepared where you find that within your will you have absolutely been cut clear and you have stipulated that if you have an outstanding account a debt to be paid with somebody this is mentioned in your will and this will is updated as the times go not that a person passes away, a person dies, he goes into the grave, he's subjected to punishment in Alam al Barzakh, and his offspring and children are not able to pay the debt because they didn't even know that the debt exists to begin with. You will find that we have an entire chapter within Islam the fiqh of bookkeeping, accounts, the fiqh of keeping accounts. Whether it is expenditures and incomes that you are measuring, whether it is keeping a log for your homes, whether it is keeping a log for accounts payable and accounts receivable. We have an entire system within Islam. For a person makes a habit in his will that the debts that I have, the money that is receivable, just as it is important to record debts, it's as important to record money receivable. Today I die and I don't have any records of the money that is owed to me. I leave behind my children and my wife without any avenue of income. This is a dunya where the strong prey upon the weak. Therefore you find even within Islam and you read inside of Surah Al-Baqarah, you have this importance that transactions that are made should be written. Record everything. The hisab be clean and transparent from the beginning. Another thing that comes under this fitna of the akhirah, you find or fitna on Yawmul Qiyamah by extension, the adab in the qabr is also referred to as a fitna, where there is a hadith by Ahlul Bayt, Salamullahi alayhim, where the masum imam says, protect yourselves from the fitna of the qabr by reciting Suratul Mulk. 
fitna of the qabr يعني, punishment within the qabr whether it is the squeezing of the grave or the intensity of the questioning and answer from munkar and nakir or wal ayadu billah the punishment in alam al barzakh imam says the more you recite suratul mulk you protect yourself from the adab of the qabr why should i leave my destiny in the qabr in the hands of somebody else why should i have to wait for somebody to recite surah al-fatiha on me such that my state in the grave becomes better a person takes hold of his destiny from now a person those those that performs those a'mal and ibadat that give him control over his own destiny surah al-mulk a person even he recites once a week la bas khair and barakat this one week half an hour or one hour for surah al-mulk i set aside one day or one hour in my week as an investment for my akhirah how i have time which for my dunya for my income for my savings for my future and 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 i leave one hour a week minimum for my akhirah surah al-mulk my investment of a property in akhirah property without adab qabr is a property it's so going to be your house until the time of raj'a or until the time of your mul qiyamah another amal which is absolutely simple and yet even has great benefits and protects a person from adab within the qabr or the fitna within the qabr is ghusl jum'a akhi hadith mentions that the person who performs ghusl jum'a on the days of friday Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the benefits of performing the ghusl jum'ah is that he is not touched by the adab of the qabr and particularly the squeezing of the grave the person takes advantage and the sharia Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rahman and rahim a person who is not able to perform the ghusl on jum'ah during the stipulated times does it for example with the knee of qada outside the stipulated times or if he feels he will not have access to water he does it with the niya of raja on the day of thursday but a person should always try to keep this habit simple actions friday most of us are going to shower from that shower one minute two minutes person does a ghusl saves himself from the adab of the qabr sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad so the eighth meaning of the word fitna as per the usage and the terms within the quran is the adab of the akhirah in particular nar jahannam and by way of extension the punishments within the grave and the by way of extension the dalil is that the word fitna is used by imam al baqir in the punishments of the grave moving on the ninth example or the ninth usage of the word fitna within the quran surah to shams you find surah to shams is mustahab to recite on the day of eid in salatul eid and within surah to shams there is an entire treasure of ma'rifah like every other surah within the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bismillahir rahmanir rahim was shamsi wa dhuhaha wal qamari idha talaha والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما طحاها ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها كذبت ثمود بتغواها إذ بعث أشقاها فَقَالَ لَهُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ نَاقَةَ اللَّهِ وَسُقْيَاهَا فَكَذَّبُوهُ فَأَكَرُوهَا فَدَمْدَمَ عَلَيْهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِذَنْبِهِمْ فَسَوَّاهَا وَلَا يَخَافُ أُقْبَاهَا This verse in Surah Al-Shams talks about the people of Nabi Saleh and the way in which they treated the camel. In Surah Al-Naml, the camel which was created by way of miracle is referred to as a fitna 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Naml speaks about the camel at the time of Nabi Saleh that was that came into existence by way of miracle as being a fitna. How? How can the miracle of Allah be a fitna? Over here, a miracle of Allah is categorized as a fitna. In that, do people believe in this miracle and uphold the sanctity of this miracle or no? The story of the camel of Nabi Saleh. By way of summary, you find that Nabi Saleh was ordained as a prophet by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the age of 16. At the age of 16, he was ordained as a prophet, went to his community, and he preached the message of Tawheed up to the age of 120. From the age of 16 to the age of 120, almost 100 years he has preached in his community. And the narrations tell us that after a hundred years of tabligh, he had very few, if any, believers. How frustrating it must be for a Nabi. But Nabi is blessed with sabr. Ahlul Bayt are blessed with sabr. Hundred years of tabligh and the community is not worried. They came to an extent that they are even frustrated with the words of Nabi Saleh. Every day for the last hundred years you have been talking to us about Tawheed. So they came to a point where Nabi Saleh said to them, It seems that you are frustrated from me and I am frustrated from you. Let us hold an ultimatum where you put together all your idols. And they had about 70 idols that they used to worship. So Nabi Saleh says to them, put forward all your idols and let us have an ultimatum where I respond to your gods and I will ask them for one thing and you ask my God for one thing. Whoever's God fulfills their desires, it will become very clearly that that God is the true God. So they said, yes, we agree to this ultimatum. And what happened is that all the idol worshippers in the village got together and they prepared these 70 idols and the day of the ultimatum came. So Nabi Saleh appeared and he said, do you want me to ask your God first or do you want to ask my God first? They said, no, no, you ask our God first. So he went, he said, you have 70 idols. Which one should I go to? They said to the biggest one. Nabi Saleh went to the biggest idol and he said to me, looked at the idol with the whole village now looking and have all come to witness this act he went to the biggest idol and he spoke to the idol I would like to know your name can you tell me your name the idol is there not replying Nabi Saleh says to them I asked your idol to introduce himself give me your name your idol is not speaking to me Shunu, what is this so they got together and they did some of their rituals and a'mal to try and make the idol talk and they rolled themselves in the sand and the dust and they came to Nabi Saleh and they said ask again Nabi Saleh tried nothing happened a third time a fourth time one time they told Nabi Adam that the God is angry with you he will only speak to you if you bow down in front of him so Nabi Saleh slightly bowed down just in order to complete the hujja itmamul hujja until nightfall and now the community sat together and they said we're going to be exposed this is a disaster for us. These gods have refused to speak today. So Nabi Saleh says to them, look, if you all are defeated, how about you ask me for anything you want from my God and my God will give it to you immediately on the spot. So the entire community selected 70 heads of the community. 70 heads of the community. How in every community you have the wadil. Even at the time of Nabi Saleh, the community had the wadil. So they got together 70 of these wadils together. And they said, look, we will come up with you to the mountain. 
to witness and to make the request from your God. If we see it with our eyes, we will accept in your God. And because we are the heads of the community, if we agree to your God and we believe in your God, then naturally the rest of the community will also come under the same belief. Like how you have in a tribal system, where if the head of a tribe, for example, votes for a certain political party, you find the entire tribe votes for the same party, even within the Middle East. You'll find where there are some places where if the monarchy is not ruling, even if within the corrupt democratic system, you find that the means of voting within the tribal communities is like this. You convince the head of tribe to vote for a certain party and the entire tribe votes. So the same mentality. Nabi Saleh asked all the people on the ground, you are in agreement? They said, yes, we are in agreement. Khalas. They went up to the mountain. They went up to the mountain. Nabi Saleh said, what do you want me to ask from my Lord? They said to him, Ya Saleh, ask your God, can he create a camel from within the mountain? And that camel should be of a particular color with red hair, yani an expression of the best grade camel. And the camel that is in the latest stages of its pregnancy, such that it will give birth upon being Upon coming out from the mountain, Nabi Saleh said, This is something difficult for me, but it's something very easy for my Lord. So he went into a state of sujood, and within sajda, he asked for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill the prayer and to make this miracle happen. The narrations or the historians mention as soon as Nabi Saleh raised his head from sujood, the entire mountain began to shake and the mountain split open, trembling everybody and from within it a camel brings out its neck. As you know that the neck of the camel is very long. And slowly this camel began to come out from an opening within the mountain. And you find that this is the camel just as they had asked. And moments later this camel gives birth to its baby. Entire mu'jizah happens within the eyes of the people. And you find subhanallah, Amir Rasulullah makes a comparison between Amirul Mu'mineen and the camel of Nabi Saleh. You find there are a number of similarities. Just like the way the camel from the time of Nabi Saleh was a miracle that was born, that came into existence, and an entire mountain was opened for it. In the same way, Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam, the house of Allah was split open such that his mother could enter inside and split open when Amirul Mu'mineen was born. And similarly, you find. That Rasulullah says, you are just like this. Your sanctity is like the sanctity of the calf of Saleh or the camel of Saleh. How the person who killed the camel is the ashkul ashkiya from the awwaleen. Ya Ali, the one who strikes you while you are in a state of salah, is like the same wretched person who struck the camel of Saleh from the ashkul ashkiya of the akhareen. Fa mu'jizah of Allah. When the 70 people saw this camel, together with its calf that has come out, they said, O oh Saleh, we believe in your God. Now we just need to go down the mountain, down the hill, so we can convey the message to the community. The narrations mentioned there were 70 elders of the community of Saleh. From the time they witnessed the miracle, to the time they climbed down the hill to go to their community, 64 of them changed their mind. Yakin, after having seen a miracle, as they were walking down, shaitan, waswasa, they said, La, show no miracle, he's a magician, this is magic. Sihr. How many people? 64. Six people remained on Yakin and Iman. From these six people, one also went into doubt 
and left remained with Baal. See, when we read within the hadith, Man arafa nafsa fakad arafa rabba. To understand the nafs is very important. Bani Adam is like this. Even it is within the nas of Bani Adam, even if he sees a miracle in front of him, he still has the audacity to do kufr. This is why the dua, last night we were speaking about very briefly the importance of duas from the Quran. And you find many times verses of the Quran are in the form of dua. This dua that you use inside of Qunut is absolutely important. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana la tuzigh kulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. Ya Allah. Today you have given me Iman. Today I'm a believer. Thank you. But Ya Allah, do not let me waver and come off the right path tomorrow, the day after. Today each and every one of us are mu'mineens, lovers of Ahlul Bayt. But we don't know. Shaitan may have control over us. Two years, three years, five years, we become enemies of Ahlul Bayt. Allah never show us this day. But this Iman, person has to take care to preserve this Iman by way of dua. This is what happened in the community of Nabi Saleh. In any case, the community of Nabi Saleh, because we may cross over our time. Nabi Saleh, the camel was there. And it was born by miracle. Nabi Saleh said to the people, listen, this camel, there is one day the camel will drink from the river. There was a central river or a pond in the village. One day the camel drinks from the river or from the pond and the other day the rest of the people from the village can drink. And the day where the camel doesn't drink from the water, every one of you in the village can benefit from the milk of the camel. Bosh deal. This is a good deal. You find that this continued people abided by it for some time until they became fitna in the community why should this camel get an entire day to drink the water from the pond? And they found one wretched person who came and struck the neck of the camel while it was drinking water. The baby camel saw its mother being killed in this way. The baby camel ran up to the mountains and began to weep in a loud voice. Nabi Saleh comes out and he says, what did you do to this camel? If you don't do istighfar, there is an adab that will come to you. Arrogance. They called for the fitna and this was their, they called for the adab and this was their end. They got destroyed by eternal damnation. So, the camel of Saleh, which was a mu'ajizah, at the same time served to be a fitna. Fitna, who is honoring this miracle? Who is going to abide by the sanctity of the mu'jizah? And you find the same imtihan today, but in a different shape. Don't you find that mu'jizat of Ahlul Bayt, sometimes when they are narrated from the member, people belie these mu'jizat? Over there you had somebody killed the mu'jizah with a sword. Over here people killed the mu'jizat of Ahlul Bayt with their tongues. Hadith that a Imam from the Aibma of Ahlul Bayt, one time he was in the house of one of the Khulafa of Bani Abbas. They made fun of him and there was a picture of a lion on the, on the wall. The Imam did dua and this lion from a picture came out of life and devoured that person who was making fun of him. Or you have the mu'jizah where Imam al-Askari, from Imam al-Askariyain, the Imam was sitting in a dungeon with wild lions and none of the lions attacked the ma'soom Imam. Subhanallah, we've reached a stage where mu'jizat and miracles like these are mentioned on the member. They said, these are stories that are, don't make sense to the intellect. These are majalis that are not academic. Ya akhi, one of the primary conditions of faith is to believe in a mu'jizah, to believe in this alam of ghayb, to believe in the powers of an unseen that can make the unnatural happen. This is a fundamental part of our faith. This is what separates us from a materialistic and an atheistic culture. 
that a culture with faith believes in the unseen where miracles and abnormal unnatural occurrences happen like this in order for a person to show and prove to the rest of the community and the rest of the world that he is supported by a divine power that nobody else is supported with. Hence his claim for prophecy or a'imma. For the last meaning, the ninth meaning that we will discuss today uh, for our series of the word fitna is imtihan by way of mu'ajizah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Asatida, senior scholars and khutaba within the Hausa have always mentioned to us by way of wasiya that the majlis khitam, the final majlis, should always end with the dhikr of the masaib of Sayyida Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. We have been blessed to be here for the last 10 days or so. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he may fulfill the hajat of each and every one of you and give you bliss in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. The Masaib of Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen, Fatima al Zahra, upon the martyrdom of Rasul Allah. When the Ashab got together through the Saqifa to usurp the right of Amirul Mu'mineen. The Fir'aun of this Ummah came towards the house of Fatima with a group of people who have lit their torches with fire. They came outside the house of Fatima and they cried out, Ya Ali, come out to give the bay'ah or else we shall burn down your house. Sayyida Fatima came and she said to them, O people, will you burn down my house? Knowing that Hassan and Hussein are inside. They said to her, O oh, Fatima, leave the talks of the women and tell your husband to give the bay'ah. She said to them, O oh, people, what is there between us and you upon the martyrdom of my father? The conversation became insulting. They began to insult Sayyidatinissa in Alameen until they decided to attack the house. The narrations mentioned that Ibn Sahak lit the door of Fatima on fire. As soon as they lit the door on fire, he kicked open the door. Sayyida Fatima Zahra was crushed between the door and the wall. She cried out in a loud and painful voice, Ya Abata. When he heard the voice of Fatima, he kicked the door for a second time, breaking the rib of Fatima. Sayyida Zahra fell down to the ground, crying out, Oh my father, look at how this Ummah has treated me after your death. The narration mentions he slapped Sayyidatin Isa al Alameen across the face and then he kicked her in the stomach, making Bohsin Shaheed. Sayyida Zahra cried out, Ya Fidda Sanidini, O Fidda, come and help me, for indeed Mohsin has become Shaheed. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon, wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the Shaykh of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. Ya Allah, hasten the reappearance of Imam al-Hujjah. Ya Allah, make us from amongst the Ashab and the Ansar of the awaited Imam. By the Shaykh of Sayyidah al-Zahra, Ya Allah, Grant the Shuhada of Baghdad with the highest level of Jannah. Bless their families with the power of Sabr. Ya Allah, by the sake of Sayyidah Zahra, do not let any one of the Mu'mineen and Mu'minat leave here today except that you have fulfilled their hajat. Ya Allah, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, forgive them their sins. Do not let anyone remain with sins with the ending of Shahrul Ramadan. 
Marhumin and Marhumat who have passed away, Ya Allah, make their graves into a garden from the gardens of Jannah. Wa akhiru da'wana nilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen yakulu Allah ta'ala. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا ابن أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوصيين السلام عليك يا ابن فاطمة الزهراء سيد سال العالمين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين خصوصا سيدي ومولاي بالفضل الأباس ابن أمير المؤمنين وأختك زينب وبنتك السكينة جميعا ورحمة الله بركات السلام عليك يا غريب الغرباء السلطان ابو الحسن علي بن موسى الرزا ورحمة الله وبركات السلام عليك يا مولانا يا صاحب الأسر والزمان الأمان 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 من فتنة الزمان السلام عليك يا شيك القرآن السلام عليك يا إمام الإنس والجان أجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله تعالى مخرجك وزهورك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك لهجة ابن الحسن سلواتك عليه وعلى بيه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناسرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم الراحل ومنا صلى الله عليه وسلم